five. And you kind of wave your hand, and I'll catch you out in my peripheral when we. All right, welcome everybody to Wednesday night Bible study here at Expedition Church of the Triad. So glad to have you with us tonight. Uh, God is good. Jesus is Lord, and um, it's just good to uh, be together. Amen. How good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Praise God. Uh, we're on lesson thirty-four of the Bible in the light of our redemption, covering the second coming of Christ. Hallelujah. Next week, we will be, uh, this lesson will continue into next week. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, previously, we've studied about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, how he's come at this appointed time to um, establish the church, to re reveal Christ to us. And um, 2 Thessalonians 2, 7 lets us know there's a point in time for him to be taken back out of the earth in this dispensation. For the mystery of lawlessness doth already work, only there is one that restraineth now until he be taken out of the way. This one, that is the Holy Spirit, is restraining the work of Satan and um, his time, there is a time to come when he will be taken away. Okay? So why hasn't the Antichrist been revealed? Because the Holy Spirit's restraining the, the Satan. Okay? Um, Let's look at a couple of things about the return, his return and or ascension back to the Father. Uh, um, during this dispensation, he entered the world. Um, he, has, he is, in one sense, incarnated into the, what Kenya refers to as the mystical body of Christ or the corporate body, the spiritual body of Christ. Hallelujah. The church. Um, since the time he came, the body of Christ has been his habitation. Know you not, ye are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In whom you are built together for a habitation of God in the Spirit. Ephesians 2, 20 and 2. Okay. Let's talk about this fact. When the Holy Spirit leaves the world, he will not disembody himself, but he will leave in the body of Christ. He'll leave with us. Now think about it. The great tribulation will not be able to take place until the spirit of God is removed. Satan will have free reign on the earth, absolute free reign for a period of almost seven years. He will be absolutely uh, at work. People will worship him. They'll, they'll give a, a allegiance and a, a ablation to him. He will be um, in this world as God. Now, if the Holy Spirit were here and people were believers here with authority, they'd be binding him up. We bind you in Jesus' name. He wouldn't be able to function the, that same way. Okay? The rapture of the church, a term that is not used um, per se in the Bible, um, but is the catch, catching away. Um, the church will be taken up in the Spirit, be united with glory with Christ, the head of the church, who himself is the Savior of the body. The Holy Spirit, having been formed or having formed the body of Christ, and he will present it to Jesus, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle. Now, um, an, uh, an older uh, minister, an author, wrote uh, by the name of A.J. Gordon, uh, the rapture of the saints in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 17 is the earthly Christ, that is the body of Christ in the earth today. That, that's who we are, the body of Christ. Okay, um, to meet the heavenly Christ, the resurrected Jesus in his glorified state, taken up to be united in glory with Christ, the head of the church. So the head and the body will be reunited in fullness as him as the savior of the body. It is not by acting upon the body of Christ from without, but by energizing it from within that the Holy Spirit will affect its glorification. In a word, the comforter, who on the day of Pentecost came down in no form of, of a body out of flesh, will be at, at the parousa, which is a word that's Greek used in the catching away, return to heaven in that body, what we refer to as the mystical body of Christ, the glory, the spiritual body of Christ. Okay. When will this take place? Uh, at the return of Jesus. Now, let's look at the scriptures, uh, and, and, or as we study the scriptures, about his return before we uh, go forward too far. In prophecy, 
in parable and in teaching, Christ revealed that he is coming again. Jesus made it clear, I'm coming again. I will come again. He said that many times. More than 300 verses in the New Testament deal with the return of Jesus. God's prophecies never fell in their fulfillment. Every prophecy of Christ's first coming was definitely fulfilled. So every promise of his second coming shall also be fulfilled. Uh, Isaiah's prophecy came to pass when a virgin conceived and bore a son. Isaiah 7, 14, behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a babe. Uh, Christ was born in Bethlehem in fulfillment of Micah 5, 2. The whole world had to be enrolled, uh, however, to bring, about, bring it about. And of course, Luke 21, 1, 21, they were brought together and every man taxed in their own city. Christ was born in Bethlehem, like I said, Bethlehem out of five two. That, that happened because they had to be taxed. They went there. He was born in Bethlehem, which was not where he was living. But they went in the forced taxation. Okay. 20 prophecies of Psalm 22 were fulfilled when Christ died upon the cross. Isaiah 53 was fulfilled as he was made sin in our behalf and sickness on our behalf. The Holy Spirit revealed to the prophets of old that these, that these events, hundreds of years before Christ came. Now, think about crucifixion. When you look at Psalm 22 and see a very clear depiction of crucifixion, which they had no way of having anything to, to compare it to because Psalm 22 describes a man dying as a crucifixion, which was not instituted as a form of capital punishment by the Roman Empire until 1,500 years later after Psalm 22. That's when crucifixion became a means of capital punishment. So it's not like it was around and he just kind of, oh, we'll, we'll pick up this. This something took place 1,500 years later. Okay? 1 Peter 1, 10, 11 states, concerning which salvation the prophets sought and searched diligently who prophesied the grace that should come unto you, searching what time or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did point unto when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that should follow him. So they, now listen, here's the thing. Prophecy seen in retrospect seems so clear. How could you miss it? But look at, think of the things. And remember when Christ was born, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem and the uh, Magi came, remember, and went to Herod. And he called in all, all the scripture people, all the, the religious leaders. And they're saying, well, he's supposed to be born. Uh, he's supposed to come out of Bethlehem. And, you know, had a, you know and, and then you start going through all the different things. He'll be a Nazarene. So he's supposed to be a Nazareth. Well, how is he going to be born in Bethlehem, be a Nazarene, come out of Egypt? Hello? Of a virgin. I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. And then you find out they were forced taxation. They went to their hometown of Bethlehem. He was born there because she was great with child. All right. At the age of two years old. Now, remember, uh, the Magi did not show up at the manger. They didn't do it. And the Bible even basically tells us this because um, when Herod realized that they did, they went home another way. Remember the Lord, the spirit of God told them to return a different way because they seek the life of the child. He, um, he was angry and he went and had every child in that region killed under two years old, according to the time that he had diligently inquired of the Magi. Jesus was about two years old when they showed up in a house, wasn't in the manger. He was in the house. Okay. About two. So the spirit of God woke Joseph up and said, flee to Egypt. They fled to Egypt when he was about two. And then when he was about near, nearly 12, um, the spirit God, the angel appeared to him and said, now go back. Those that saw his life were gone. So then when they went to Nazareth and he grew up as a Nazarene, okay, under the Nazarene vow, they couldn't cut their hair, shave their beard. It was, it was a, it was a covenant with God. Uh, of sanctification and holiness, so they couldn't cut their hair, shave their beard. Okay. And uh, so here's these prophecies are all fulfilled, but go back before they were fulfilled, before they happened, and look at it. And you're going, if you're a, if you're a scholar going, Bethlehem, Egypt, Nazarene, Nazareth, 
I'm confused. Which one is it? All of them. Amen. All of them. Well, we've got New Testament prophecy scriptures about Jesus is coming back and everybody thinks they got the answer. I mean, it, that, that's the thing. Some of it, some people might be close. Some people might be spot on. Some people could be are, are way off. A bunch of people have been way off for years because they prophesy on dates and stuff. And it's going to, you know, wrote books, got rich on 87 reasons. Jesus is coming back during Rosh Hashanah, which was September of that, that year, like September 7th, 8th, and 9th of 1987. Didn't happen. He wrote a new book. 88 reasons. Jesus is coming back during Rosh Hashanah in 1988. The 88th reason was he didn't come in 87. Boy, you could keep going with that one. Hello? I mean, if he was still writing that book, it would be twice or three times the size it was back in 87. You know? 2,300 reasons Jesus is coming back on, 2020, uh, on Rosh Hashanah 2022 or something. I mean, he didn't come back the year before, the year before, the year before. Well, eventually you're going to hit it right, pal. You remember five, five years ago, a guy put up billboards. Jesus is coming back in May or March of that year. And people quit their jobs and went up to the mountains and were waiting for the Jesus to return so they could take off and fly up and go. And um, I mean, and he, he come back because it didn't happen. Everybody's sitting up there on the mountain and it didn't happen. And he miscalculated by six months. He was coming back in November. He didn't come back in November. Now, if Jesus said no man knows the day or the hour, that the Father has it to himself, not even the Son of Man, then guess what? You don't know either. We might be, we, we, listen, we can look at seasons, we can look at times, we can be in the neighborhood, but you're not going to know the exact. Here comes a thief, the Bible says a thief in the night, meaning unexpected or, or not anticipated. Amen. He's going to come in an, un in, in an un unanticipated manner. He's going to swoop. Okay? So I'm not against end times teaching and people who teach end times. What I'm against is setting dates. Now, are we close? You better believe it. Amen? I can almost hear the sky crack. Okay, he's close. All right? Time, time is getting close to the return. Glory to God. But a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is, is a day with the Lord. So what does close mean? It could be 30 more years. It could be tomorrow. We don't know. We're in, we're in the window. You know, um, we're like the hurricane tracking map. This one over here and this one over here and the storm's going to travel somewhere in between. Well, we're in the time of really, really close or kind of close somewhere in there it's going to happen we just don't know and nobody's model is, is exactly accurate okay and everybody's got a model well i don't i don't really know i'll just tell you i don't know all right so but anyway um his the prophecies concerning christ were fulfilled in the old testament now we have uh, like we said, over 300 New Testament scriptures that point to his return. Amen. Um, that should give us confidence and faith in the New Testament. Again, I said all that to make you understand we don't need to be too caught up with trying to figure out exactly when. Because what, what are you planning? Okay, if you do this, because here, here's what most people would do. If they knew the date, their flesh would take over and they would live like any way they want to live right up to the last couple of 10, 15 minutes and then go get right with the Lord and go. That's a lot of people. Now it shouldn't be, but that's a lot of people. Now he's coming on September the 8th at midnight, uh, 2025. Well, man, that gives me, uh, almost three years to to party hardy and live it up. And then I'll just get right with the Lord right up there on September the 6th. You know, give myself a day advance just in case it comes early. That's how, that's how people think so many times. Okay. 
So Brother Hagin used to say it this way, live like he's coming back any second. Plan like he's not coming back for 50 years. So make you, because here's the problem with what we do a lot of times, and, I, and we'll, we'll get back here, is when we get to think about Jesus could come back any second, we stop living. We stop planning. We just get ready for him to come back. You, you're, you're, you're basically, Satan has, okay, he can't push you out, so he pushes you too far. He makes you ineffective. Because what's the use of me doing anything? He'll be back any second. No. Go ahead and plan. Buy the house, buy the car. Hello. Are you here? Live your life, get married, have children. Well, what if I give birth right before he comes back? Hey, the baby goes with you. Okay. What if I'm pregnant? Hey, the baby goes with you. Are you here? All right. Um, now, looking at the, for the scriptures that foretell the second coming of Christ, there's, there's two phases of the coming. The first one is the rapture. That is, in which the church is called to meet the Lord Jesus does not come to the earth. He comes in the clouds. First, that, look at the, uh, Second Thessalonians or First Thessalonians chapter four. Verse 13, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them that are asleep. Now, remember the Bible, the New Testament, using the term asleep means physically dead, but alive unto God. Okay. Uh, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Now, let me just say this. Um, during the word of faith height, we, you know, or the confession or whatever, the uh, bunch, we've got a little excessive and stuff sometimes extremely excessive you couldn't people couldn't be sad that someone died what about says sorrow not as others which have no hope didn't mean don't sorrow but your sorrow is not like theirs we have hope we miss them we're sorry they're gone we love them we wish they were with us because we just enjoyed having them here but there's joy in knowing that they're with the lord now um the uh, Sister Beerman, which y'all have probably don't have any clue who he is, but Patsy Caminetti, which was um, I, I know Patsy and her husband uh, Tony, and I've known, I've known Patsy since I went to Rama. Um, she was she was uh, teaching at prayer school and teaching some of the classes, and uh, before she married Tony Caminetti. But I've known them for a long time. Went to the Bible school of Damata with them in in uh, uh, Italy. They're wonderful people. Her her sister, uh, Mark Hankins' wife, Trina. It's, Mar it's, it's Patsy's sister, Scott Beerman, who I, I know, um, and we, we know Pat. We know um, um, the, the the Hankins casually. You know, we, we see them. I mean, they know who we are. Okay, now, now, now I don't know them real very well. They just but they they communicate with us on Facebook and, and like stuff we have and that kind of stuff. They they like our kids stuff and all that kind of stuff. Okay, uh, they're all sisters, and there's one more sister. Now their mom, Sister Beerman, passed away last week. Now there was something going on, and, and um, apparently she decided it was time to go. They all they all were around the bed and sang her into glory. Hallelujah! Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Sitting there with Mama when she slipped out, they were singing because you know, they all sing, and it's just a singing family. And you know, her uh, uh, the Beermans were, were ministers for for years, Mom and Dad. Okay, and uh, they just they sent her into glory. Singing, singing the old hymns and stuff. Praise the Lord. What a way to go. Yeah. You know, just send them off. Praise God. Yeah. Packed up and took off. Hallelujah. Yeah, they sorrow at her loss here. But they rejoice in knowing she's with the Lord and they'll be with her not many days hence. Yeah. Amen. So we sorrow not as a, and what a way to go. I mean, the, the kids, maybe some of the grandkids, uh, Janet Brzee, Knew, the Brazilians knew, knew the, the Beermans real well. She went out two weeks earlier and spent some time with Sister Beerman, and they just sat around and sang the old hymns and, and all this. Man, glory to God. What a home going. I said, what a home going. 
Hallelujah. Kids are serving God. Kids are in the ministry. Grandkids are serving God. Hallelujah. And they, they all are gathering around just singing about glory in this. Go on home. Hallelujah. Praise God. You know, Wigglesworth got up the morning he died and they went to, sat down at breakfast table with his family and said, I'm going home today. And they thought Papa had gone crazy because he's in the house. He meant, he, and he, they just didn't get it. He went back down the hallway after he ate breakfast, sat in his chair and took off. He was going home. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. Um, that you sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, do we believe that Jesus died? Do we believe that Jesus rose again? Yeah. yeah. Even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. What, what do you mean sleep? Their bodies. See, they left without their bodies. When they died physically, their body was put in the ground or cremated or whatever. It's gone ash to ashes and dust to dust. But their spirit, Paul said, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. For the believer now, that's not the sinner. Sinner wakes up in hell. They're absent from the body to be present with the devil. Man, that's a bad deal. Y'all hear you going home. But if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so are them also which sleep in Jesus, will God bring with him? So when, they, when he comes back in the air and doesn't come to the earth, all the saints, all those who've believed on Jesus over the past 2,000 years and all the captives that were held in Abraham's bosom when he went and preached to the captives in captivity and led them, led captive, captivity, captivity captive, and brought them up, even so much, some of picked up their bodies, went and talked to the family members. <coughs> Matthew says that. And some people go, oh. Matthew said it. They went, they went, and they got it, came up out of the graves and went and talked to the family members. That'll upset you. There's Uncle Charlie. What? He's been dead for 20 years. He said, we saw the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. You better believe. Amen. That'll mess up your uh, bad theology. Amen. Well, God bring with so all those saints are coming back with Jesus. That this great cloud of witnesses are going to be with Jesus. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. Now, this is basically say this. Paul said, I'm prophesying. I'm speaking by unction of the Holy Ghost. That we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them. Now, prevent meaning precede. Okay? Them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. What? Their bodies. Because you see, the Bible talks about our redemption not being complete until we have a glorified body like Jesus's resurrected body. So when those Old Testament saints come back in the clouds with the Lord, right before the living saints are caught up, all those bodies come up out of the graves, out of the earth, and are reunited with them, what? As an incorruptible, immortal body, and they are reclothed in their final estate of redemption with the Lord. Amen? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air to meet the Lord. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And then um, hallelujah. I was looking for the other, other verse. Come on, where is it? Let me see where he talks about this. At. I don't have my walking concordance here. Okay. Now the Bible talks about this corruption and incorruption. And this corruptible shall put on incorruption. This uh, mortality shall put on immortality. And we change in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. 
and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Okay? But it says here, Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the air to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Can you say amen? amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. And so at that moment, at that, at that resurrection moment, hallelujah, Yes, ma'am. Yep, I'm in 15, and I'm looking because I was 52. There we go. 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, and for the trumpet shall sound, the dead in Christ shall be raised in corrupt. Now, see, that's what happened. Now, Paul said, makes it a little plainer in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 that the dead in Christ, shall, their bodies shall be raised up. Here, Paul says that they'll be raised in incorruption, and, sh and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, this mortal shall put on immortality. And so when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So, at the catching away of the saints, so these two passages of scriptures in combination, um, the dead in Christ shall rise first with their resurrected glorified bodies. We, then we, we, we which are alive remain, our bodies will be changed and we'll rise and meet them in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. So this is the catching away of the saints. This is the rapture of the church. This brings great upheaval on the earth because all of a sudden all the Christians are gone. <clears throat> well, who went with us? The Holy Spirit. Because he's in the body of Christ. It's, it's the end of his dispensation. And now Satan has been basically loosed for, a, according to the word of God in the Old Testament, a week, which oftentimes is symbolic of, a, of seven years. Hallelujah, or not hallelujah. So the Holy Spirit gives us this, this picture of us being caught away. It will affect every member of the body of Christ. You're going whether you want to or not. I don't think anybody's been going, no, I'm not ready to go yet. I was, I, oh, oh, oh. Well, okay. Okay. Um, the Lord who had ascended into heaven has taken his place on behalf of his mediator, intercessor, advocate. He shall descend from heaven with a shout. And every living creature will hear that shout. And the unbelievers have no part in this. They don't get to go. If you weren't ready when he showed, you don't get to go. And the shout with the signal will signal the resurrection of the bodies of those who've died in Christ. The bodies of those who are with Christ shall rise first. And they who are the, all the living believers shall be caught up. The Greek says in the clouds instead of just in the air, in the clouds. And um, kind of, you know, think of the reference, the great cloud of witnesses of Hebrews chapter 12. Not necessarily the clouds of, you know, cumulus or whatever, strata, you know, different um, cloud formations of moisture in the atmosphere, but a cloud of saints. Okay? <coughs> the spirit of the departed will not be raised at the, at the rapture. They're already with the Lord. We've already stated that. Their bodies will be raised. They'll be, re they'll be reunited with their glorified, immortal bodies. Um, our spirits can never die. So we, you know, we're with the Lord. The dead in Christ are not in the grave, but alive in Christ with him. 1 Thessalonians 4.14 tells us that those who died in Christ shall come with him at the rapture to receive their glorified, immortal bodies. Okay? Okay. Um, so we're going to have these. And then those, if you're alive, you're going to be standing here and whoof. You'll be floating, you'll be taken off, and your bodies will be changed. And guess what? There ain't nobody going to be going, what about the white church or the black church or the Asian church? Ain't nobody going to be talking about that. Because you're going to look down at yourself and you're going to be a glorified body. What's that going to look like? Glorified. Amen. It ain't going to be like it was. It's going to be different. Yeah. 
Okay? Paul, now, Paul says that flesh and blood could not inherit the kingdom. He said, but we were changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. From 1 Corinthians 15. Our citizenship is in heaven, according to Philippians 3.20. Okay? And he'll fashion our bodies anew um, after the rapture. We shall actually receive a glorified, immortal body like that of Jesus. Holy Spirit, look over in 1 John chapter 3. Now remember, Ephesians talks about that we, we, we are waiting for the, the manifestation or we're, we're, we're sealed with the seal of redemption until the purchased possession. Amen. 1 John Chapter 3, 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now, when? Now are we the sons of God. Okay, let me see. The margin has a thing here. Let me just see if, if it says something here that's children, literally children. All right, the children of God. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us. We, call, we should be called the children of God. Now are we the children of God. What does that mean? Not when we get to heaven. Not at the rapture. Not at the end of all things. Right now, we are the children of God. Okay. And it, listen, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. Why? You have nothing to relate what the glorified body looks like. Hello? We have nothing to measure it against. We've got descriptions in the Bible to a certain degree, but we still, unless you go look at a force ghost in Star Wars and kind of go, well, that may kind of be like it. You gotta be a Star Wars nerd to really know what that means. That's where Obi Wan Kenobi and Yoda and, and Anakin are all glowing, and at the end of Star Wars, you know, there's a little aura around them glowing because they're light beings or whatever. That's that still ain't gonna cover it. Okay, I mean that, that, that might be kind of on the direction, but that ain't gonna cover it because it just it does not yet appear what it shall be. But we know that when he shall appear. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, this is going to be, see, the saints that have already passed away have already seen in the glory. They're, in, they're living and existing in that heavenly realm. We haven't. So those which are alive and remain shall see Jesus. And, and I, I kind of look at it this way. It's kind of like, uh, he comes, you look up, you see him, and you go, oh, and step right into it. That's it. Oh. Today, I, I got the new corporate stamp for the uh, church, the, you know, the, the embossing stamp. The way it came packaged, I couldn't figure out how on, how on earth does this thing work. I'm trying to press it. Nothing's happening. and I can't figure out how you're going to get paper in there. I can't, I can't figure it out. So um, I went somewhere and told Janie, I said, honey, she said, well, let me look at it. She calls me about a minute later. I got it figured out. And I'm thinking, how in the world? How in the world? I said, well, what she said was real simple. Now, the way this thing came was kind of a handle, and the, and the, and the embosser was slid into it sideways inside this, this handle. And I figured, how, how can I, how? There was just no way to make it work. I come back in. She's taking the thing out. It's turned sideways like the Starship Enterprise stuck in there. And you go click. How did you figure that out? And now that I've seen it, I could do it all day long. Okay? It's like, oh, that. You ever had that happen with something? You can't figure it out. You can't. And then somebody shows you and you go, It was that easy. It was that simple. All gone. 
uh, Mark Redwine told us one time, he said that um, he used to work on big uh, HVAC chillers. And they'd fly him all over the country. And um, they fly him. So he, he flew out west somewhere one day and went up on the roof and uh, did a couple tests and turned one knob and said, okay. And God said, that's all? We paid you for turning one knob? He said, no, you paid me for knowing which knob to turn. <laughs> Hallelujah. You paid all that money for, for me to know which one. But now they could have done it any time after that once they saw it. Oh, you turn that knob, that boom. You see what I'm saying? Well, when Jesus comes back, the Bible says we, when we will see him as he is and will be his. So it says here, um, when, when he shall appear, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. It's just going to be a revelation to us. Oh, that's, that's it. That's the re purchase redemption. That's what we're waiting for. And as soon as we see it, we'll just step right into it and start. Some of you be going cool. Like if you're really old, you might even say something like totally rad to the max. If you're old, as old as Dick, you're probably going to come out with like groovy. Far out and groovy. Now, was groovy on the beginning of your era or at the end? Okay. Yeah, Dick, Dick was in on the the the, the uh, inst instituting of the word groovy. Hallelujah. All right. And so, the rapture will take place. We'll be changed. Our bodies will be changed. Flesh and blood won't inherit the kingdom of God. We have a glorified body. Amen. Can you say amen? And then, um, since we've already been conformed in the image of his, in the spirit, we are now waiting for the redemption of our bodies, the receiving of a glorified body like unto the Lord. Paul calls it looking for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory and the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Luke tells us in the, the day that the Son of Man is revealed, and that night there shall be two men on one bed, and um, on one bed, the other one taken, the other left behind. There should be two women grinding together, and they should be taken. One should be taken, and one shall be left. Amen. This shall be the eternal separation of the body of Christ from the world, as we know it. And then there will be the great marriage supper of the Lamb. Hallelujah! The members of the body of Christ shall be welcomed by Jesus, by the Father. Rewards will be given. Um, possibly. Some of this is not real, real clear, but possibly at offices and positions during the millennial reign. Hallelujah. We don't know quite definitely this, but um, we will go before the judgment seat of Christ according to 2 Corinthians 5. And um, some people will lose rewards. Some people will gain rewards, but you don't lose your salvation. And in this time together, it's called uh, Revelation 19, 7. Let us rejoice and be exceeding glad. Let us give glory unto him for the marriage of the Lamb has come. And his wife has made herself ready, as it was given unto her that she should array herself in fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteousness, righteous acts of the saints. Revelation 19, 7 and 8. And then in verse 8, 19, 9, uh, he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they that are bidden to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And this is going to last several years. What's going to be going on on earth? The great tribulation. The body of Christ has been taken out of the earth. The Holy Spirit went up with the, the, the body of Christ. The Messiah has left the earth. And the earth is left for this period of time under Satan's authority. Okay? And the Antichrist shall rise to power. Now, according to Isaiah 26, um, 16 through 21 and 27, 1, it's going to be led by Satan. Okay, this great tribulation. The, the, the epistles don't even mention this subject because they won't have any effect because the body of Christ won't be here. There's no instruction in the epistles for this time period because the church won't be here. According to Jesus' last words, it seems clear that the greatest tribulation the world has ever known will take place, especially upon the Jews, before his coming in glory at his revelation. The Antichrist will appear. Um, 
only used by John, but also Paul writes and calls him the son of perdition, the lawless one, the man of sin. Daniel refers to him as the king that will magnify himself above every other God. Uh, Daniel eleven thirty six calls it the king shall do according to his will and shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every God and shall speak marvelous things against God, the God of gods. And he shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished for that which is determined shall be done. Um, and he, it appears that he will be some type of demonically anointed antichrist. Now, not Christ, but opposed to in rebellion towards an opposition of Christ. Okay. And so he'll have, he will have a demonic anointing. <clears throat> he'll work signs and wonders. During this tribulation, there will not be one single believer left on earth. There will rise Jewish prophets who will pro prophesy. Now, you've ever heard, you've ever heard the uh, Jehovah's Witness talk about there's only um, uh, 144,000 people getting saved. They've misinterpreted the 12,000 from each tribe of Israel in the, in the book of Revelation to meaning only 144,000 Christians will go to heaven. They are 12,000 Jewish virgins from each tribe of Israel who will become evangelists during the tribulation. Christ will reveal himself to them and they'll become born again and they will lead, they will lead an evangelistic crusade during the tribulation. Israel will be grafted back in. Okay? Remember, the desire that caused the downfall of Satan and changed his nature will be was the desire to be like the most high. And so he'll, he'll roll, he'll rule. And um, he promised Adam and Eve that they would be like God. He desires to take God's place in the life of man. He even tried to secure the worship of Christ. So in this period of unrestraint, he will sit in the temple, setting himself up as God. The Jews will make a pact with the Antichrist for one week that you remember about seven years, who will permit the sacrifice and the oblation. Um, he shall form a covenant, Daniel 9, 27, with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause a sacrifice and oblation to cease. And uh, upon the wing of abomination shall come one that make a desolation and even to the full end and that determined sh shall wrath be poured out upon the desolate. But he'll break the covenant that was made in the middle of the week. So about three and a half years in the, he will break the covenant he made with Israel. And then the time of Jacob's trouble will come. And if you refuse to worship the beast, you'll be killed and you won't be able to buy or sell without the mark of the beast. Um, the most stupendous triumph of Satan shall be when he shall appear as Antichrist and exalt himself above every other God, compelling man to worship him, but it shall be short-lived. Why? Because Jesus is coming back for the battle of Armageddon. Okay, now we're going to get into that next week, some of that stuff next week. Okay? So, what Scripture shows that there's a point in time for the Holy Spirit to leave in the world? 2 Thessalonians 2.7, Ephesians 2.22, and Ephesians 5.7. I'm putting this out so you can go back and look it up, okay? Why is it the body of Christ will leave when the Holy Spirit leaves? When the Holy Spirit leaves the world, he will not disembody himself from the mystical body, but will leave in the body of Christ, okay? How are we certain of the return of Jesus? Well, in prophecy, in parable, and teaching, Christ revealed that he is coming again. There were 300 New Testament verses Deal with this fact. God's prophecies never fail in their fulfillment. Every prophecy of Christ's first coming was definitely fulfilled, so will every promise of his second coming be fulfilled. Two phases, the rapture and the revelation of his coming to earth uh, with his church in full display of his power and glory. Hallelujah. At this time, he'll set up his church. After he, he defeats Satan in the battle of Armageddon, he will set up the thousand-year millennial reign on the earth. Okay, what happens to living believers when Christ comes? We're caught up in the air to meet him. What happens to those who fall asleep? They rise first with their, new, their glorified bodies. What takes place at the meeting of Christ and his bride in the air? While the tribulation goes on on earth, the marriage supper of the Lamb. What will cause the tribulation upon the earth? The appearance and rule of the Antichrist. And why are the epistles silent about the tribulation? They don't deal with the tribulation because it won't affect any believers. Remember, the epistles are written to the church. 
on how to live and walk out with Christ. All right? And why, what is the ambition of Satan and assuming human form of the person and the Antichrist? To fulfill his quest of being like God. And it just ain't going to happen. Now, remember at the end of the thousand years, he's loose from the pit to tempt the nations one more time. And then he's cast into the lake of fire forever, which is the second death. Bad news, baby. Amen. Now, the, 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 other, the other thing is, when we see him cast into the pit, because we're going to witness this, here's going to be the response of the church. Is this he who caused the nations to tremble? It's kind of like, he's the Wizard of Oz. Little man with his machine scared everybody. He's nothing. Remember how the, what revelation they had in the Wizard of Oz, that the, 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 the wizard was nothing? There's some little old man with a machine running, pulling levers and pushing buttons. That's what we're going to have this, this image of Satan. Is this he who calls the nations to tremble? You got to be kidding me. If you knew what Satan looked like and what Satan like and what you, who you were and what you had, you'd never fear him again. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. So next week we're going to move into um, more of this, this, um, connecting with the tribulation, the triumphant return, return of Jesus to the earth where he will come and stand on the earth and enter into the eastern gate. Hallelujah. Uh, the, the, um, the Muslims, the mosque in Jerusalem, they've claimed that it's the, you know, that they've claimed the site. What they did is they built on what they thought was the old temple site to, to prohibit the Jews from ever rebuilding the temple. Well, the Jews found out that the foundation of the temple is 300 feet from when they built the mosque. They have uncovered the uh, ancient ruins and the footings of the old temple. They know where it is. And it's 300 feet away because there was going to be holy war on all the Jews if they tried to take the mosque and rebuild the temple. And they got to rebuild the temple. They messed up. They missed it by 300 feet. Hello. And so, but they, now they're saying if they even try to start rebuilding it, they're going, they're going to go crazy. Now, the eastern gate is an actual gate in the wall that the Muslims have taken possession of that sector and they have bricked it up. <laughs> now, I hate to tell you, pal, if, G, if Jesus is the son of God and he's coming back supernaturally, your brick ain't stopping him. Okay, he will come through the eastern gate, brick or not. Okay, and um, Joe Morris, a good dear friend, um, he went and visited that mosque, and on the inside, written in Arabic, over and over and over again in a circular pattern, going up to the top, says, "There is no Son of God. There 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 is no Son of God." Until he shows up and goes walk through the eastern gate, and then it'll probably melt off the ceiling. Hallelujah. Glory to God. There is a son of God. There is the son of God. First begotten from the dead. And your brick ain't going to stop him from fulfilling his call and purpose. At the second coming of Christ, not the rapture, but the actual, when he comes to the earth to defeat the Antichrist and to establish his millennial reign. Hallelujah. For a thousand years, a millennium, a thousand Hallelujah. And sit on the throne. Hallelujah. Glory to God. It's all coming. I said it's all coming. Praise God. All right. Um, let's get our, uh, this is our offering. If you've got an offering envelope, need, it, need one, take it. Fill it out. If you're giving electronically, go ahead. We are still using the old hashtags and, and so forth. That has not been changed yet. Um, some things are being delayed because Jesse and Capper are out of country. And uh, Jesse got to preach the other day. Jet Cap got to share today. Jesse was laying hands on the sick uh, in the meeting and uh, praying for people with the fire of God in their hands. Um, you know, me, people who knew me, overseers of old Demata schools that knew me from when I was traveling over there. And, um, you know, so um, it's, it's just it's a blessing. It's a blessing. 
Hallelujah. And uh, he's putting an putting itch in me. Mm. Hallelujah. Got to get out of this school system and get back on, get back out there. Hallelujah. All righty. Praise God. You can go ahead and send your offerings electronically. Hallelujah. Father, in Jesus' name, we bless the people as they tithe and give. Thank you that the uh, windows of heaven are open unto them, and you pour out blessings. They don't have room enough to receive. In the majestic and mighty name of Jesus, we call it done. Amen. Amen. Anybody got a, a, a cash offering in house? Just raise your hand, Joe. Pick it up. If not, that's cool. I know a lot of people giving electronically now. Hallelujah. Joe's like, you about to put me out of business. Isn't that right, Joe? Yeah. Uh, just don't let, don't let any crazy people come in here and come after the pastor. <laughs> Hallelujah. Take them down. Take them down. Hallelujah. No, I'll take them down. I don't, we'll, we'll work on the love part later. Uh, now, have y'all ever heard of Billy Sunday, the circuit rider, Methodist preacher? Now, he went to some rough places. And he'd have uh, mockers come in and disrupt his services. He'd stop the service, walk back there, beat them up and throw them out and go back and finish the sermon. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. Listen, we love everybody. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Be back next Wednesday night. Uh, join us on Sunday. Look, come and, and, and be with us in person. We'd love to have you. And uh, right here at Expedition Church of the Triad, we are 4.3 miles from the Interstate 85 Elm Eugene exit, exit 124 here in Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, Come be with us. We'd love to have you at 6302 Walter Wright Road in Pleasant Garden, North Carolina, 27313. Praise the Lord. We'd love to see you. God bless you. Until we meet again, remember these words from 1 John chapter 5 and verse 4, that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Good night. We love you. God bless you. See you next time.